At the time that I'm recording this video, the city of Chicago has been in shelter in place for just under two months. So faced with a rapid change in my daily life and routine, my partner and I decided to deal with that, as so many of others have, by taking on a fairly ambitious baking project. We decided to try to make our own sourdough starter. And it failed. Spectacularly. Three different times. As I watched our source of flour slowly begin to diminish, knowing that it was a very hot commodity and hard to find, I finally decided to phone a friend and try to figure out exactly where we were going wrong. Now, somewhere along the lines of being asked if I was uh, measuring the sourdough, the starter's temperature, uh, if I was making sure to feed it at exactly the same time, if it was finding, making sure that I was finding an ideal place that was both uh, not too warm, but not too cold, and in a sunny spot without too much direct exposure, I just started thinking to myself, I was not aware that I was in a personal relationship with a bread starter. Bread of Life Sunday looks really different during a global pandemic that limits so many people's ability to receive the Eucharist. For many of us, Holy Week and Easter Sunday came and went without being able to take part in the core center of, for many of us, our liturgical life, the reception of the body and blood of Christ. Without the Eucharist, how do we talk about what it means when Christ says, I am the bread of life? As I read the first reading today and heard that reminder and admonition uh, that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, I tried to take some comfort in it, but I just kept thinking it's just not the same. But then I remembered that at the end of the day, the Eucharist begins and ends in relationship, that that's where it all comes from and where it all returns to. I think it might be helpful for us to really engage this week's gospel reading if we have a sense of what's happening off screen, what's happening just before Jesus begins to explain to us what it means to be the living bread of life come down from heaven. See, at the beginning of this chapter, he's actually just fed 5,000 people. After enacting this miracle in typical Christ fashion, he heads off to pray in the desert. And when he comes back, the crowd meets him and specifically uh, tries to ask him where he's been and what's going on. And Christ fairly astutely says, I wonder if you're here with me uh, because you believe in me or rather because you want to be fed. The group then uh, basically hedges their bets and says, ah, uh, well, you know, uh, Moses was able to produce bread in the desert, so maybe that's a sign that you can give us that will help us believe in you. At which point in time, Christ says, I'm the bread of life. I am what has come here to nourish you. That then goes into a very long conversation where the crowd continues to be confused and keeps asking for bread, and again and again and again, Christ says, I'm the bread of life. I am the living bread. It's through me that folks come to the Father. That admonition over and over again that it was a relationship with Christ that people needed to be fed by. That's at the root of our faith. That's a reminder of where the Eucharist comes from. And so it's with that reminder of the center relationality of the Eucharist in the back of my mind, I've been trying to re-engage and remind myself of what the experience of the Eucharist is. I'm thankful in these moments uh, to have what Andrew Greeley would call the Catholic imagination. It's that sort of window that many of us tend to have where we're able to see God's movement and participation in all of life around us. Right? God isn't this distant thing that we need to go out and find, but rather God is invested, incarnated in the midst of our own lives, inviting us continually to feel God's presence, to feel God's love, and to return over and over and over again into relationship with God. It's in these sacramental moments, right? These moments of grace that point back to the ways that we experience grace through the sacrament that I find myself being fed and being reminded of what the reality of the Eucharist looks like uh, for me and on a regular basis in my own life. I'm sure you can think of some of these moments as well. Maybe it was the first date that you had with uh, your special person in your life across a cup of coffee or a glass of wine where you really just thought, this, this is it, this is this person. 
Maybe it's during meals at family dinners or uh, larger holidays when you look around and you feel known, you feel seen, you feel like you really belong. Those moments of being held, those moments of being seen and loved, that's on some level an echo of the reality of the sacrament. That is Eucharist, reminding us again to be in relationship to God. It's Christ over and over again reminding us that I am the living bread. I am the bread of life. You're coming through me. You're experiencing God through me because I'm in relationship with you. Because God so loved the world that he sent his only son to live our lives, to know what it was like to be human, and ultimately uh, to give his own life for us. But it goes beyond that, right? It's relationships are about more than just what we receive, but it's about how it's lived out. And so again, I think the words from the letter to the first Corinthians is a great reminder to us that the Eucharist isn't a spectator sport. We participate in the body of Christ when we break the bread. We participate in the blood of Christ when we drink from the cup. Living into a Eucharistic reality means participating in it. It means saying yes to that relationship again and again and again. It means trying to model the Eucharistic relationship that we have, that God offers us to everyone around us. The folks that we love, the folks that we are troubled by, the folks that we know, the folks that we don't. The Eucharist and its call to be in relationship to it is a challenge over and over again for us as believers, and perhaps more importantly, to us as a church in this time when we find ourselves so distant. So on this Bread of Life Sunday, how do we think about what it means to participate, to love those who seem unloved, to go beyond the boundaries of our own understanding of who fits and who doesn't? I want to leave you with one final story. Many years ago, I spent Easter Sunday in Kingston, Jamaica, at a place where children who had essentially been abandoned to die in a dump uh, were able to live out their lives with dignity. In the middle of the Mass, uh, developmentally de- a developmentally disabled child who had been essentially sort of making noises throughout the majority of the Mass and encouraged by uh, his caretakers to stay quiet. At the very moment of epiclesis, as the priest raised the host above his head, stood up, pointed, and shouted, Jesus, 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 then pointed to himself and said, Jesus, 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 and at the entire crowd and said, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. And in that moment, I knew that I had been fed more than I could have ever conceived. So friends, as Christ reminds us that he's the living bread come down from heaven, how can we participate in that reality?